John and I'm Pete and, and we're, we're here, here to, to talk, talk about, about fuel diversity. diversity what it is and how important it is for you to know what it is welcome to what is fuel diversity Before we start talking about fuel diversity and why it's important, we, you need to understand how electricity gets to you. When you turn your light switch on, how does the power get there? Do you ever wonder why when you turn that light on over your stove, the light turns on? Do you ever trace it backwards and think about where it comes from? The panel box and the meter on the side of your house and that meter box being connected to wires that go to the street where the poles are and those wires going back to a substation? That sometimes you'll drive by, but it never occurs to you what it is or what it does. Those substations are connected to even bigger wires called transmission lines, which go back to even bigger substations, eventually leading to a power plant, which is where generation takes place. Talk about generation. How does that work? Well, I'm talking about a few concepts. Magnets, force fields. Yes, it sounds sci-fi, force fields, and magnets inside of force fields, which is really cool current and agitating electrons. So in order to create a force field or a, what I would say a magnetic field, you have a conductor that's carrying current. So I mean conductor like aluminum, gold, um, sometimes steel, copper, whatever. And you have current, electric current moving along that. Well, as that moves along and it goes through a coil of another wire, it creates a magnetic field. Um, and as that, well, it only creates a magnetic field if that coil is moving around it. And the, the more that coil moves around, the more ro relative motion, the more current going through, the bigger the magnetic field gets. And that magnetic field is what actually will create current, which seems kind of weird because you need current to create current. Talk, you, you won't have to know about that. Just understand that the current on a conductor going through a field of coils will create a magnetic field if there's a re relative motion between the two. Okay, so let's talk about current. If you have a conductor that has no electricity on it at all, but it goes through a magnetic field, and you turn that magnetic field, that creates a current, and that creates electricity. So what is happening here is you have a generator, and that's spinning a turbine. The turbine is spun by water, or it's spun by coal, heating steam, and the steam goes through the turbine. And anyway, what's that doing is that, that's rotating your magnetic field. And then that current going through the magnetic field, it starts to vibrate back and forth. So it goes back and forth. And in the United States, that's 60 hertz. That's um, one cycle uh, every, what, 160th of a one second. 160th of a second, yeah, right. 60 times a second. And in Europe, it's 150th. Um, so basically, um, this is going back and forth really, really fast. And you're like, well, how can electrons going back and forth really, really fast impart power? Well, suppose that this is my uh, group of electrons, and they're just free-floating, and I start agitating them. I can actually impart power on Pete without even touching Pete. I'm not touching him, not touching him, but I'm, in power, I'm imparting power on Pete through this dry erase. I'm not doing a product placement for Expo, but um, it kind of gives the idea that... Um, the power is actually coming from the steam turbine. That's the power, that's the beef in the system. And the electrons are just getting agitated back and forth, back and forth, but imparting the power to where you're gonna turn your light bulb on, that's how it gets there. So like Pete is the light bulb on the generator, I'm imparting power on these electrons, and then boom, Pete moves. That's, that's it in a nutshell. To give you an example how fast those electrons move, they go back and forth 60 times a second, and it takes the human eye about six cycles, or <clears throat> six sixtieths, or one-tenth of a second to blink. And those electrons are moving back and forth 60 times a second. One cycle is one-sixtieth of a second to tell you how fast it is. All right, now that we've explained how electricity gets to your house, 
Now we're explaining different types of how we produce that electricity. Now, in case you're wondering, Pete and I, um, I've been in the electric industry since 1995, and uh, so I've done various things in the electric industry. That's where I have my, informa my information, my, my experience. I was also a nuclear Navy, um, I was in the nuclear Navy as a mechanic. I ran the engine room. So, and Pete, your experience? I've been in the uh, utility, electric utility industry since 1991, working in transmission and distribution in the control room, also in substations, and also in the safety end of the business with people building substations and working bare hand up to 500,000 volts. Yeah, when Pete was doing meter reading and in substations, I was in submarines. So, <laughs> a little bit different areas we came to. I came from the generation side. Pete came from the field side, from the uh, line side. All right, so what types of fuel sources do we have? Now, these aren't necessarily fuel sources because some of the things we're going to tell you don't actually burn, but we'll call them fuel sources anyway. So coal, you grab some rock out of the ground, coal, it has carbon in it, you burn it, it heats up steam, and it turns a turbine. You have a combustion turbine. Basically, you take diesel fuel, gasoline, natural gas, kerosene, whatever you want, that combusts and you create a combustion and you, you put it in a combustion engine or a combustion turbine and that spins and that's the motive force to agitate the electrons and then um combined <coughs> cycle you take uh you take the idea of natural gas making a combustion turbine and then you take the heat from that and then you put that in another turbine that heats up steam and basically you're using a very efficient way to not waste all your energy from the natural gas uh, and then there's hydro Hydro is one of the cleanest forms of energy production on the planet. You take a river or a stream where there's good flowing water and you connect a pipe to it. The water goes through the pipe and it goes downward. Uh, the water collects in the forebay, which is the top where the river's up high, goes down through the pipe and goes into the generator, making it spin. As John explained, when things spin with the coils and the stator and the rotors, it causes generation of electricity, and it comes out the tail race and continues on down that river, maybe to the next hydro station or just down to the river to where people fish or boat or wherever that water leads to, to the ocean inevitably. But hydro production of electricity is very efficient. They can also produce it by creating a man-made forebay, which would be a pump station with a very big reservoir that they always have a source of water to feed down through the pen stocks and pipes into those generators and always have that availability for that generation. Yeah, Hydro is very of, reliable. Have you ever heard of Ludington, Seneca, or Bath? Bath, the biggest one storage. on the planet. Yep. But then there's Run of River too. Yep. You're talking about reservoir types, there's Run of River. Run of River is more challenging in the summertime when there's not much water because it doesn't rain and the temperatures are warmer. You have to, as a uh, electric utility person, operate the hydros efficiently to when the water collects in the forebay, you run it through the hydro generation. You might not be able to run it 24 hours a day, but you're gonna run it during those peak times when people want electricity, want their air conditioning, and want things to work inside their houses. So more challenging, but still mostly reliable all well, year round. The cool thing about run of river is you can tap off the river. The river is flowing. You don't have to kill, you know, you don't have to destroy people's houses and make a reservoir. The river goes to the side basically and then comes back into the river and that just spins a turbine. Um, and that's easy. The river's flowing, like the Ohio River, whatever. You put a run of river, and you can get lots of power, and it will keep renewing. It's um, free, and it's clean, and it's very, uh, very efficient. Then there's nuclear, which you use a uranium oxide pellet. And uh, what you do is you start with the source and basically start that to fission. It gets to fission, and then that fission will heat up water. That water goes through a steam drum, which heats up another water, basically keeping the two waters separate because one water becomes radioactive with cobalt-60. The other water is free of that because there's iron, or there's not iron, but there's, there's strong metal in between the two. And that water gets heated up, and it gets moved to that water in the boiler, the steam drum, and that gets turned to steam, which turns to turbine. Basically, nuclear power is almost the same as coal power, except for... Um, it's a lot more compact and there's a lot more power there. And if you think that nuclear waste is a horrible thing, um, I found that you, you know if you have a nuclear radiation field, you can plant hemp and in a year that's gone. But yeah. that's highly <clears throat> controversial and people are like, oh, that's not true. But you know, you can try it, experiment, look it up. The French have found ways to recombine yep. used nuclear fuel so that you can even reuse the nuclear fuel so there's not so much waste. The French don't have nuclear waste, they have nuclear recyclables. They recycle all of their nuclear waste. 
So they are the poster child for efficient and safe nuclear operations. And there are zero emissions yep. from nuclear power. All right, we're talking about wind. <clears throat> then there's wind and solar. Now, wind and solar fall into the same bracket as hydro as a renewable energy resource. These are resources provided by the environment. They're free and they're clean. The only catch is, as I mentioned with hydro, during the dead of the summer, when there's not a lot of water in the river, uh, run of the river in the river or the waterways, you're challenged to run those efficiency um, sources of uh, energy production. And when it comes to wind, if the wind isn't blowing, when it comes to solar, if the sun isn't shining, or sun um, is inhibited in the winter time, or maybe snow is accumulated on solar panels, there's different challenges to those industries. But they do produce energy, and they are a, a good source of energy. They are just not fully reliable all year round, and there's challenges with those forms of and energy. And places where you have lots of wind and lots of sun aren't usually places where there are yeah. lots of people. And you have to build so big you, transmission yes. lines, and it costs a lot of money. Give you an idea of the average cost of a transmission line in 2021. To build a line that's somewhere between 15 and 80 miles long connecting two substations, say a solar farm or wind farm, to a substation that can connect inevitably to your house or your lights work, about $163 million average cost. Usually five to six years to have it come to fruition. Two more fuel sources, and it is a misnomer because they're not actually, some of them aren't actually fuel. Like wind, you can't burn wind, you can't burn water. Well, you can burn water, but that's not what we're talking about. The fuel source is something that will move uh, an engine or move a turbine to create electricity. So uh, we won't worry about semantics here. All right, geothermal. You cut a hole in the ground, you heat some water with some hot springs or some lava. Basically, you're cutting a hole near an open volcano or near a volcano that you're, you're opening a hole in a volcano. I, I just, geothermal just doesn't make me feel good. Um, all right, tidal. Places. So tidal energy, you have as much energy as you have the moon going around the earth, right? So as the tide comes up, it, it rotates some gears on these devices and it creates electric current. As the tide goes down, same thing happens. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back through our fuel sources and talk about pluses and minuses. Tidal, like I said, you've got as much energy as you have the moon going around the Very earth. Very dependable. Right. Geothermal, you got lots of volcanoes, no problem. Problem is toxic gases, um, hydrogen sulfide, everything. one of them. Yeah, yeah everything. Um, solar panels, like Pete said, what if it snows? What if it rains? Uh, and the other thing, is, and well, I'll, I'll put this together with wind. So wind at 45 miles per hour of wind, you have to shut the turbine down because you'll break it. They'll lock them off. Yeah. And then as we're, the reason why we're doing this is because what happened in Texas, five degrees, they freeze. And then you put a bunch of oil on them to get them to unfreeze, which is kind of ironic because you're trying to... Using a petroleum-based product to <laughs> preserve your green energy okay. with non-green products. The, so the other thing about wind... Can't make it up. Is, um, yeah, you can't make it up. The other thing about wind is that they're noisy. They're 100 foot tall monstrosities that make lots of noise and they disrupt the, I don't want to use Al's thing, Cloud, The quality of life for they, the neighbors and the community as well as the ecology with the animals and the birds. Right, they, they mess up natural natural frequencies and natural resonances. It messes up animals' flight patterns and it basically kills a lot of birds. If you go to the, one of these um, ridges in West Virginia, or not West Virginia, but uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania yeah. you've got hundreds of windmills. You go to Indiana, hundreds of windmills. You find the base of them are a lot of dead birds, which you're probably like being destroying <laughs> endangered species with your windmills. And uh, you know, you're kicking farmers off their land because they're gonna kill the spotted turtle while you're, uh, you're destroying the seasoned egret because he's running into a wind turbine because he doesn't know where to go because of all the noise. Uh, so the next thing, nuclear. A lot of people aren't so happy with uh, Fukushima. I, I worked in a nuke plant. We know how to make safe power and the French can actually take uh, uranium oxide and recombine it to use it again. So not much waste. The other thing is if you throw nuclear waste in a, a landfill, <laughs> not that this is <clears throat> something I would recommend, but if you plant hemp, that waste will be gone, that radiation will be gone in about two years. So, and it, it actually is true. Uh, I know it sounds ra crazy and ridiculous, but um, we're just trying to inform you guys. Hydro, problem with hydro, well, good thing about hydro is rivers are constant. Like Ohio River, Monongahela, I don't know why there's no hydro in the Monongahela, but. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you rivers flow, and then you can also tap off of creeks or whatever, make a reservoir, and basically it's sort of like free energy because the river's already there and you're just taking an energy from it. Problem is you create the reservoir, now you've destroyed people's houses. And then when you're using the reservoir, because now that the people's houses are destroyed and people whose land didn't get flooded out now have really good real estate on the beach, um, you use the hydro plant and now their boats are sitting in the mud and they hate that. And then you don't use it because you got too much power. <laughs> now you've got no beaches and your your boats are have to be taken out of the water. And the water creeps up their backyards. <laughs> and another thing about Run a River, Pete mentioned earlier, is that... Uh, when the, the middle of the summer, when the river is not running very much, or you have these, wad, basically, it's kind of like a wadi. During the springtime, there's lots of water. During the summer, there's no water. So that's the problem with run of river. Uh, combined cycle, natural gas, and, and people say, okay, it's a fossil fuel. Natural gas is a, a clean fuel source. And when you put a third engine in there to take the heat, so you don't waste it in the yeah, atmosphere. Yeah. You're creating an efficient machine. I, I'm i really hip on, on combined cycle units. And natural gas is fairly clean. And that, so combustion turbines, if you're burning diesel or gasoline or oil, yeah, I, I don't recommend those. But if it's an emergency, your generator you have in your house, it's running on gasoline. And you're, you're basically clogging up the atmosphere with gasoline fumes and things like that. Um, and then coal, you use coal, and coal makes this dirty, rotten, smelly stuff coming out. But believe it or not, people have spent millions of dollars to try to figure out how to make clean coal. Yeah. And if you look at our country, and you look at the, the power plants we have, and you go, oh, look at all that stuff coming out of there. That's actually steam. Or not even steam, it's condensate. It's not. Correct. You don't actually see the coal coming out yeah. like we used to. Um, back in the 60s and the 70s when it was really nasty. If you look at China, they're not cleaning it, and that's nasty. If you look at the United States and Canada, we have clean coal. I mean, and you might say, oh, there's no such thing as clean coal. There is. Here's the, but we are endangering ourselves by not opening ourselves up to the possibility that we can stay clean with coal and fuel oil. Not now. We can't stay clean with fuel oil. No, stay clean with coal, coal and natural gas. Coal's come basically. a long way. The scientists at the local hydro plant <laughs> south of us here in West Virginia told me that less than 1% of what you see coming out of the stack is the carbon and the chemicals. They have cleaned coal energy. I think it's 30 to 40% cleaner today than it was when I was a kid 40 years ago. It's and, come a long way. And then what most people see is the, you know, the condensate. They, the steam. they go, yeah. oh my gosh, look at all that stuff going there. It's, it's condensate. Yeah. Okay, what is fuel diversity, Pete? Fuel diversity is simply what John just did going backwards through the laundry list of fuel resources. To have multiple sources of fuel to produce energy makes you reliable, makes your system reliable. When we start to pigeonhole our energy sources and our electric grid, to one or two choices of fuel resources like wind and solar. A lot of our politicians say we want to be 100% renewable on wind and solar by 2030 or by 2025, and they create aggressive goals. And they start to retire our coal plants, our combustible natural gas turbine plants, um, even our hydros. They neglect them, and they don't maintain them. And they're trying to let our nuclear plants get mothballed and retired as well. And then all of a sudden you get a polar vortex weather system or maybe a 10 or 12 day heat wave of above 95 degree weather. That will tax our system and prove that we need fuel diversity. We need multiple sources of fuel to keep the energy providing the generation, balancing the generation with the load and the demand of you, the customer, so your house is cool in the summer, warm in the winter, and all of the things that you have that need electricity to run will run properly. There are two physical limitations with wind and solar that we need to talk about. They are physical. We cannot get around them. The other thing about reducing our emissions and, and basically getting rid of all of our power plants, um, we need wires to get the power from the solar plants and the wind plants that aren't in, loca are in locations where people are to get them over here so that you can use the power. And then we need to create batteries or flywheels or storage units for these devices so that when the wind dies down or when the sun goes away, 
the power won't just immediately go away. And the other thing is about these batteries and these storage units and these devices for solar well, uh, photovoltaic cells and everything. These devices and these things come from heavy metals. A lot of things we produce come from heavy metals, especially like the new batteries. And guess where heavy metals come from? China. China, right. In most cases. And, and China is still using their power plants. You don't hear about outages in China. You hear about outages in Brazil, Europe. You hear about outages in India, Texas. But you never hear about outages in China because China is not getting rid of their power plants. Um, so two physical characteristics that you cannot escape with wind and solar. Intermittent. Explain intermittent. Intermittent is when things aren't consistent, when things can be uh, unpredictable, and when you really need it at that worst possible time, it's not available, something breaks down, something isn't functioning, that is intermittent. You need things to be consistent when you're operating the grid today for liability. Like when the wind's blowing and then it stops? Correct. The sunshine, the wind, even the hydros can be tricky, like John mentioned and I mentioned earlier with the summertime. If it's not a, a very big waterway with a good flow of water, they measure it with cubic feet per second. And in the springtime with the snow melting and the rain of the springtime, April showers bring May flowers, you can have 15 to 100,000 CFS on a river or waterway. In the summertime, if there's a, a heat wave and there's hot temperatures and not a lot of rain, you could be down to less than 150 CFS or cubic feet per second on a hydro waterway. So intermittent can be the evil that prevents us from making the grid reliable. We yeah. need things to be consistent. Right, in order to make them consistent, we don't have battery, we don't have storage units, flywheels to, to make up for the power yet. We could, but then there's another physical problem we gotta overcome. Um, and not that they can't be overcome. Coal units, uh, if, you, if you have a coal unit, that's going to stay there and back up a wind unit or solar unit. So suppose you have wind and solar. You have to have an equal amount of generation, megawatt generation, to make up for the fact when the sun goes away or the wind dies. Okay, so the other thing about intermittent is power plants. So if you have these old coal power plants, and I've heard and they said that, well, wind's not reliable because of the five degree weather, but coal's not reliable either because we called on them and they weren't there. Like, okay, listen to this. In order to get a coal plant started up from cold, wet layup, you need a week. That means uh, that it's cold and it's wet. I mean, it's all the water is in the piping and everything. It's good to go. All you gotta do is warm it up. That takes at least a week to get started. Now, if it's warm, like if the plant has people operating it and manned, you can get it started about three days. And once it goes cold, you need a week, and that needs to have a warning time ahead of time. You need to know what the weather's gonna do. You need to know what people are gonna do ahead of time. You pretty much have to predict when the wind's gonna stop blowing. So in order to make up for windmills or solar, you have to have an equal amount of generation online, running, ready to go. So say a unit, a coal unit's at 100 megawatts output. The wind dies down, you lose 100 megawatts. That unit, maybe has a 400 megawatt capacity, now they crank it up 200 megawatts to 200 megawatts and it's made up for that solar. So solar and wind are good if you have the same, uh, more or equal amount of power to replace that intermittent energy. The other thing that a lot of people miss, and this is a physical characteristic that cannot be overcome right now, inertia. You need the iron on the system. The large shafts and the fossil fuel generation equipment creates reliability in our system. The public is not aware of this factor. Most of the politicians aren't aware of it. It's called primary frequency response. <clears throat> our frequency, as John mentioned, is 60 hertz. The electrons go back and forth 60 times a second. We need to maintain that 60 hertz and those large generators and the inertia of those large generators create stability with that 60 hertz frequency that is typically scheduled every day of the year. Without the shaft and those large generators creating the inertia, when there's a disturbance and not having that stability, the system can uh, experience a disturbance and quickly go down the tubes. Where when the inertia is existent with coal generators and large generation equipment, when there's a disturbance, this, the inertia causes the generating equipment to speed up a little bit or just enough to get the frequency back up <clears throat> to an acceptable to level or just to hold it steady to so it doesn't the, go further 
down to a lower point where we don't want it. To make the nadir a little easier to manage. Correct. That nadir is the, the dipping point. When your frequency dives, the nadir is here, and that frequency adjustment by the governor from the inertia of those large generating plants turns it around and brings our frequency back up where we want it to keep the lights on. You don't want to see them flicker. We don't want to see them dim. Hey, let's be honest. It's 2021. Everything operates on a computer today. What was a short interruption of five minutes or 30 seconds 40 years ago, people can't experience a half a second interruption today because the servers go down and 300 employees are out front of the building uh, smoking cigarettes and taking a, a two hour break because they can't work because they saw a half second interruption. The grid has to be reliable. We can't afford those little blips and interruptions. We Nor have to have fuel diversity. We need fuel diversity to keep the frequency and the grid secure and stable. The other thing with uh, inertia, when we lose the system, let's hope we don't. We haven't had a blackout since August 14th of 2003. But if we ever have another blackout, when we get the system back up and running, we need that PFR, that primary and frequency response from the inertia. You can't start the grid up with uh, with windmills and solar. Okay, we, listen to us. Pete we need that are, inertia. Pete and I are system restoration experts, right? We have done a simulation. I have experienced a cascading blackout in Michigan. Um, Pete's, ex well, we helped you guys in, in uh, 2003 by not letting everybody go without power because Michigan stayed on mm. our side anyway. <laughs> New York kind of went down. Sorry about that, Pete. But yeah, uh, New you York guys... went from 30,000 megawatts down to less than 5,000. It was uh, 50 million people interrupted on August 14, 2003 at 4, 11 p.m. And it's one that we learned a lot of lessons from, including how to keep the grid stable. The one I lost on my watch was 40,000 people at once um, over a large geographic area. We got that back on quickly because we had resources to get it back on quickly. Um, and that was a tree thing and a overloading a line that uh, we had to do an emergency outage. But the thing is, it cascaded. We had resources to get that back on. If you don't have the primary frequency response, you can't get the system back on. You can't get it on with windmills. You can't nope. get it on with solar. You might be able to get some of it on with hydro. All right, so now the point of the gist of this, now we're talking about fuel diversity and why we need it. Here's why you need to know about it because you need to talk to your politicians and let them know about it. Let them know that you're not stupid, that you know what the grid needs to survive so that people aren't dying when it's five degrees outside and we lose lights, like they had in Texas with the polar vortex. Or in the middle of summer, when you have no air conditioning, if you had people that have heat exhaustion, they can't, get out of the, they can't get out of the heat. Or you know hospitals that get shut down because one, it's freezing and you can't get power there and their generators won't run. So grid stability is, is our responsibility for 30 years, so it's been our responsibility. Um, so we're, we're, we're asking you, and we're going to talk about the dangers of letting politicians dictate grid operations. First of all, it's not like the TV show Revolution that J.J. Abrams made, where um, after 20 years of the power being out, they flick a switch, then all of a sudden all the generators come back on, and then there's power in the country. After 20 years, where are the power plant operators? Where's the coal handlers, the fuel? Where, where are the guys operating the valves? You know, thousands of people needed to keep this grid alive and going and keep us from going into the Stone Ages. Because that's what happens when we lose power. We go back to the Stone Ages. So keep that in mind. I'm trying to get you a little bit more excited about the fact that climate change, okay, if you're worried about that, great. But you're going to kill more people with the cure than you are with moderation and trying to work your way there. Okay, so Pete and I both had to undergo years of training, okay? Um, background checks, FBI checks, to even get in a control room, right? Um, to even be near it. Uh, and operators who work in the control room have background checks and they get trained and they, basically they gotta go through the same training, they gotta get certified, they gotta keep their certification, all right? and We've got to do, go through what we call SIP training, critical infrastructure protection. And we've got to do that every year to make sure that we know how to keep the critical infrastructure of this country from falling apart. Why are you going to let a politician who doesn't go through any of that tell us how to operate the grid? Seriously! 
you're going to die with letting these people. Okay, I'm, I'm going off. I'll let you go because this this topic <clears throat> and Pete's been writing about it on LinkedIn a lot. It's important for people to know physics, and if you don't know physics, don't make decisions about things you don't understand. The whole purpose for this what is is to educate you, John and Jane Q public, to what makes our grid reliable. And it doesn't have to be complicated and you don't need an engineering degree. What we need to know is with fuel diversity, our grid will be reliable. We haven't seen a blackout in this country, like I said, in 18 years, at least not a major one. And now here it is, the last 36 hours, Texas and Oklahoma have been experiencing rotating blackouts because they were 14 thousand megawatts short of keeping the power on in those two states during a cold snap of five to negative five degrees. You don't want to lose power in the winter time. You don't want the utility to say, sorry, we had to turn you off. We didn't have enough generation because we retired seven coal plants. We left that nuclear plant get mothballed and be turned off and not used again. And we didn't have any diversity. We have to talk to our politicians and make it known that fuel diversity and primary frequency response are integral to keep our grid reliable. If you are on a public service commission, or if you work for NERC, or if you work for FERC, do not let these people do this. We are creating a dilemma in this country, a crisis, and it's gonna be massive proportions. I mean, there are already people that died in Texas from freezing because they didn't have power in the middle of the night when they needed it. And this is serious. This isn't. This isn't something that, okay, I'm working for the power company, so I want to keep my job, and uh, I want you guys to like power because power is good and coal power is great. Um, look, there's physics, and there's things we, there are things we can do to make up better ways to produce power, and we have been. We've been creating clean energy out of coal. We've been creating clean energy out of natural gas, and we've been creating, creating clean energy out of nuclear power. So... Citizens of this country, you need to be aware of physics. Put aside the rhetoric that the politicians are telling you and listen to people that actually know what they're talking about. I want to be clear. We're not saying green energy is bad. We're just trying to say in the most polite way possible, it is not as reliable as some of the other energy resources that we've used for the last 80 to 100 years in this country. The, the last 10 years in coal alone, we have cleaned it up 99%. Yeah. And there's, not, there's no more Cuyahoga River burning. We're not hearing about that from the politicians, though. And they're pushing the green energy, which is fine, but they're pulling on your heartstrings to have wind and solar. If we pigeonhole ourselves with wind and solar and that version of renewable energy, and we don't utilize the hydro and the natural gas resources that we have, and even if the coal energy is cleaner now than it ever has been before, there's no reason why we can't have that diversity for a safe, reliable yeah, electric grid. Wind and solar are good. I mean, they, 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 they so, serve a purpose. They supplement the system. But they can't run the system. And they're not there in a pinch when we have an emergency. Anyway, thanks for watching. And thanks for being my guest host here, Pete. Appreciate that. This has been What Is Fuel Diversity. Thank you for watching.